So the topic today is anxiety. What is actually happening in the brain and how to eliminate it? I'm Dr. Robert Melillo. Um, and this is, you know, if you want to get in touch with me, here's some of my info. Um, at Dr. Robert Melillo is really for Instagram and Facebook. And my story is I'm a clinician for with over 30 years of experience, uh, directly and indirectly work with literally um, tens of thousands of patients of all ages. I currently have a very active practice in New York on Long Island. I am an eight times best-selling author. Uh, my primary book is Disconnected Kids. It's been translated into 18 languages with more than 500,000 books sold worldwide. Um, I've also been teaching for uh, the better part of 25 years, and I've had the pleasure of teaching over 10,000 professionals worldwide, and I continue to do that. Uh, I'll be teaching next weekend in Dallas, and then we're starting my professional course up again here in New York. Um, if you're interested in that, again, all of the information is in the website. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm a university professor of developmental functional neurology. That is my primary specialty. Um, I'm a brain researcher. I have one major textbook, 60 scientific papers, 20 chapters. I'm the executive director of a lab called the Institute for Brain and Rehabilitation Scientists. I'm the co-founder of Brain Balance Achievement Centers, in which there have been over 100 centers across the country and working with the better part of 100,000 kids over the past uh, 12, 15 years. Um, in that program, we use something called the Brain Balance Program, which I developed. The latest model of what I've created, though, is called the Melillo Method, which is a, uh, a clinical model that is uh, much more directed towards a wider and more severe population. Um, and this is primarily what we use in my center here. And that's what I teach now. I'm the founder and past president of the International Association of Functional Neurology and Rehab, we also have a TV uh, show that's on a streaming network called My Home TV. It's a web series called Disconnected Kids, Reconnected Families, and it's actually number one on that network right now. Um, I'm married for over 30 years, have three great kids, multiple degrees in neuroscience, uh, clinical rehabilitation, neuropsychology. Um, I have a diplomate in neurology. I have a fellowship in child developmental disorders, and I'm currently completing a PhD doctorate program uh, in cognitive neuroscience at Haifa University. These are uh, the books that I've written, and these are some of them in uh, translate multiple languages around the world. Anxiety, this is a quote that says that a brief look into mental health statistics will suggest that anxiety is more prevalent now than it's ever been. You can find studies all over the internet that report an increase in anxiety and depression related disorders in the last century, and especially over the last few years. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental health illness in the USA, affecting almost 20% of adults over 18 years of age. According to the WHO, one in five people around the world suffer from anxiety, about 8% of children and teenagers experience anxiety disorder, but that's increasing dramatically. Over 40 million adults experience an anxiety disorder each year. Nearly one half of those diagnosed with depression are also diagnosed with anxiety. In the first year of COVID, um, global prevalence of anxiety and depression have increased by a massive 25%. And we know that um, uh, when we look at COVID, it's only increasing all mental health issues. <clears throat> Harvard's Business Review um, published a study on mental health in the workplace. And in a survey, half of millennials, those between 24 and 39, said they left the job, at least partly for mental health reasons. For Gen Z, those between 18 and 23, the percentage spikes to 75% compared to just 20% among the general population. So clearly what we see is the younger generations are suffering more and more from anxiety. 35% of students will experience a panic attack due to stress at some point. And mental health advisors on campuses say that the requests for help with anxiety and depression are sharply rising. 65% of post-secondary students 
report experiencing overwhelming anxiety in the previous year and 13% had considered suicide. These are really serious statistics. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this seminar was because of that, because anxiety is becoming so prevalent. I mean, I see it so much. We see it in our practice. I see it, you know, in when people contact me on my Instagram page, when I speak with other health professionals or people in general, anxiety is, is just such a big problem right now. What is anxiety? Like anything else, everything in your body is controlled by your brain. Every thought you have, every emotion you feel is being generated by specific networks in your brain, meaning that there are different types of anxiety that are generated by different networks in your brain. We have different networks that control different emotions. All of our emotions are regulated by specific. So what we see is that this is, you know, just something that is happening in your brain. So when we look at the brain, one of the unique features of the human brain is that we have what's called a lateralized brain or an asymmetric brain, which means that we have two sides of the brain, and this gives us a great advantage. It's essentially like having two uh, different brains in one. And humans have the most asymmetrical brain. All brains are asymmetrical, and they have been going back to over 500 million years ago. We know. Um, we just published a paper on this. And if we go back to looking at trilobites, we know that they're, back then, brains were asymmetric. But humans have the most asymmetric brain. And this is an advantage because imagine a bird looking for a seed on the ground in the midst of pebbles. They have to be able to see that detail to be able to pick out a seed from a pebble. At the same time, they need to be able to be aware of predators or danger around them. So they have to be able to do two things at the same time. And this is an example of the advantage of having two different hemispheres and how that works. When we look at any behavioral or mental health issues, um, we have to look at it in, in, in perspective of both sides of the brain. There is a famous neuroscientist named Tim Brown, and he wrote that except in the light of lateralization, meaning brain lateralization, nothing in human psychology or psychiatry makes sense. When we look at multiple disorders like anxiety, it doesn't necessarily make sense when we look at it on the surface. When we look at most disorders, we see that um, the people may have really great skills in certain areas or be able to do uh, great things. Um, but on the other hand, they may struggle in other areas. So what we see is that virtually all mental health symptoms can be traced to overactive networks on one side of the brain combined with underactive networks on the other side of the brain. That's essentially what is causing the core issue in the brain itself. And so when I look at anxiety and I work with patients, what I see is I've been able to discover that there's really two major types of anxiety. Of course, we can look at and there's many different labels for anxiety, but from a neurological perspective, not a psychological perspective, there's really two. And one is where we have overactive networks from the right hemisphere and underactive networks on the left. And then we have overactive left brain networks with right brain underactivity. And that combination can cause different types of anxiety. And I think that is you know, primarily what we see. When we look at the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere um, develops first in the womb. And it is primarily sensory driven, meaning we're paying attention to the world around us. Initially, we feel senses, basic senses, things like pain, hunger, thirst, temperature, fatigue, when we have to go to the bathroom. This is what a baby starts to experience. And what we see is that the right brain also is very visual and visual spatial. The right brain gets the big picture of the world and it controls our big muscles. It pays attention to the world around us. And so what we see is that if we have 
uh, problems with attention, like attention deficit disorder. It is a right brain deficit. When we look at the right brain, it controls the big muscles and early motor development and spatial awareness. So we see that if a, a child has difficulty or a problem with movement, what we call dyspraxia, uh, dyspraxia or uh, discoordination disorder, or if they have poor balance or coordination, it is often due to a right brain delay. The right brain is nonverbal. When a baby is born, obviously they can't speak. They don't have verbal communication. So the first form of communication is nonverbal. Um, initially, nonverbal communication is facial expression, gestures, tone of voice. And that's how we communicate. And even as we grow and develop, we always have that part of nonverbal communication, which is very important. This is related to feeling our own body, connecting with our body. The right brain is embodied. It, it feels um, our body and connects to it so that we uh, become self-aware uh, with the right brain. And the right brain also becomes what we call, uh, we gain uh, ownership of our body with our right brain. If we don't connect with our body or we can't communicate non-verbally, this is where we see when someone has poor eye contact or they don't really understand social cues. They don't pick up on non-verbal communication or tone of voice. Um, we see that some people never become embodied. They don't really feel connected to their, to their body. Many people in the autism community don't actually fully become embodied or may not become embodied till later on. The right brain is the social brain. It is about communicating and developing relationships and especially attachment to others. The right brain's primary drive as uh, all of our brain is, is to really help us survive. And the, the key to survival for humans is that we must attach and connect to other people. Initially, we need to attach to our parents so that our parents can take care of us and we communicate non-verbally our needs when a baby's in pain or hungry or thirsty or tired. But then later on, we need to be able to attach to other people. There should be this innate drive in children where they want to connect with other children and play with other children. Again, we see many kids with right brain delays. They don't have that. They don't have that drive to attachment and they need to connect with other people. We know that for ancient humans, if they weren't part of a group or if they were kicked out of a group, that was a death sentence. So therefore, there is this very strong innate drive for us to connect with other people. We know that if we have too much of that, we'll talk about that actually leads to a, a right hemisphere overactive anxiety where we have this in incredible desire for people to like us and to be connected to other people and this fear of being rejected. Um, the right brain is withdrawal behavior. We have a sense of danger in the right brain. So the right brain is aware that if there's something wrong, if something is dangerous, and the right brain also is about novelty. If we have too much of a sense of danger, again, this adds to anxiety. Novelty is that we want things to be new. If we uh, have too much of this, we can't concentrate. We can't focus. We can't do things over and over. Um, and we need to you know, learn that way. The right brain governs what we call negative emotions, things like fear, sadness, uh, embarrassment, shame, guilt. But the right brain also governs attachment, as we said, love, connection, empathy, compassion. The right brain is really more the emotional intelligence side of the brain. The right brain does what we call reality testing, and it tells us, is this real or not? If the right brain uh, is deficient, we can lose touch with the reality. And this is schizophrenia, psychosis, delusions. The right brain control is controls what we call implicit memory. Uh, when we're early in childhood in the first, the right brain learns implicitly, subconsciously. And we don't really remember what we learn, but what we learn early, especially in the first three years of our life, when we have what we call child amnesia, it's very important. That's when we learn about social skills, about developing social relationships and reading things and nonverbal communication. Um, many things that we learn that become automated are in the right brain. The right brain gets the big picture. So uh, for instance, in academics, reading comprehension, the main idea of the story, uh, many people are able to read. We have some kids that have what we call hyperlexia. They can read below the age of two. 
But then later on, they struggle with reading comprehension because they have a right hemisphere deficit and their left hemisphere is overactive. Math reasoning is like this as well, as well as geometry. The right brain regulates the gut or what we call the parasympathetic nervous system and the immune system. It suppresses the immune system so that we don't have an overactive immune system so that we don't develop allergies and things like eczema or food sensitivities to things like gluten or dairy. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system is called the rest and digest system. So if somebody has problems with digestion, leaky gut, or they you know, can't calm down, they can't sleep at night. This is often a problem with the right brain. The right brain is wired primarily, as we said, to connect with other and what we have, what's called attachment. Humans can't survive without other humans. We must first attach to our parents and as, as we said, attach to others. If we get rejected by a group, this is a death sentence. So this is a way many people feel. So one of the aspects of right brain anxiety is this over-awareness, this awareness of, you know, trying to fit in socially and the fear of being rejected. When we look at right hemisphere, we see that there are different strengths and weaknesses. Um, the strengths are things like being creative in many different fields, whether it's music or art or just inventions or thinking of new ideas, um, being athletic, uh, dance, musical, um, inventive. Uh, Thomas Edison was dyslexic. He had a very, very strong right brain. Um, we see that the uh, right brain spatial math and physics, it's been said that up to 50% of people at NASA have dyslexia because they have such great 3D spatial right brain skills. Very good at reading people and situations. They get the big picture. The, uh, they have excellent memory for events and good sense of humor. Uh, many comedians are very right brain dominant and very empathetic and compassionate. The weaknesses of a right brain with a right brain deficit is that, um, or right brain strength with left brain deficit is that they may struggle with reading, dyslexia, learning disabilities, poor memory for facts, struggling with basic math, uh, can get bored easily and find it really hard to stay concentrating on something and uh, pay attention to something. Uh, task avoidance, meaning doing everything or coming up with everything you can to avoid doing things that you don't like or that are difficult or that are hard. Um, this can lead to a lot of procrastination. Uh, all of this is related to low self-esteem. Um, the right brain um, tends to be over judgmental of ourselves and assumes other people are judging us harshly as well. Learning disabilities, um, you know, remembering different things as well, poor focused attention. This can be one type of ADHD called ADHD1 and things like jealousy are right brain uh, deficits or characteristics. The right brain anxiety is really based on three behaviors and emotions that are right brain driven and controlled. Fear and a sense of danger, feelings of guilt, shame, and embarrassment, and fear of rejection by others. Those are the main things that drive right brain anxiety. So what we see is the typical uh, profile of a person with right brain anxiety. It often starts very early on in life. Um, they have this sense of danger. It often starts, it starts out, out with being afraid that something's gonna to happen to their parents as a child. Somebody's gonna break into their home. Um, there may be a fire or something like that, that drives them. And many times this may affect their ability to sleep as a child. Um, this can lead to a form of OCD, which um, the individual may feel that they need to do certain rituals to avoid or ward off these bad things happening. They may have to touch things a certain way or jump a certain way. And if they don't do that, then the bad things might happen and then it's their fault. A lot of this, again, is driven by fear, by this by sense of danger, and always feeling this sense that something bad is about to happen. And if you can't do anything about it, this can lead to guilt and shame and embarrassment. Um, the other aspect of this is this fear of being rejected. 
The right brain is hyper aware of what other people feel, what other people think. And there's something known as metacognition, which is the ability to judge ourselves accurately. People that have very dominant right brains tend to overjudge themselves in a harsh and negative way. And they assume that other people are doing that as well. It's been shown that children with dyslexia and overactive right brains, that they react with, with tremendous anxiety just when seeing pictures of facial expressions, that they, they overreact to facial expression and emotions in other people, um, assume that other people are judging them in a negative way. They judge themselves in a negative way, which leads to, again, the um, problems with low self-esteem and also those emotions become overwhelming. In a child, they don't know any different because they've been brought up this way. This is what they've always known. And they've been overwhelmed by these emotions. Sometimes the child may become very shy. Later on in life, the adult may avoid certain social situations just because it's too much for them. Um, in relationships, uh, these people might tend to be overly clingy um, and again, need reassurance because of low self-esteem. And again, all of this drives this anxiety, this sense of danger, this fear of rejection. Ultimately, the, uh, the, the ultimate fear of someone who is a right brain dominant brain is that they will be embarrassed. They will be embarrassed in front of their peers, or they have this feeling that they did something wrong and they have this feeling of guilt and shame. And this is what drives that right brain anxiety. The left hemisphere is all about details. It's about prediction. It takes everything and looks at it and lines it up and, uh, and lines it up literally and, and looks at it sequentially one step at a time to try to predict where something is going. And that is one of the things that drives anxiety in the left brain is this constant prediction, this constant simulation of where things are going. The left brain is um, about details. So it looks at things like letters and objects and, and colors and numbers. The left brain is many, many, very motor driven. Um, it is about motor activity and especially initiating motor activity and motor planning. What we see is that if we have too much motor activity, this can lead to tics. This can lead to ADHD or hyperactivity. Um, we also know that um, the most difficult type of motor activity and motor planning that we do is verbal language and speech. We see that many people may struggle with verbal language if they had stuttering or had speech therapy as a child, or if they may you know, have a uh, language deficit where they really don't speak much. Uh, verbal language is a left brain skill, especially reading, writing, spelling. So if there's a deficit here, we see this is dyslexia. Um, you can also see that if there's a problem with fine motor skills in writing, this is what we call dyspraxia or dysgraphia. The left brain is very individualistic, where the right brain, its drive is to connect with other people. The left brain is more individual. It really doesn't care about other people so much. It really is more about itself. It prefers to be alone. So if we see a very strong left brain dominant person, we tend to be a little bit more antisocial, um, not really driven to be around you know, and make friends with people as much. The left brain likes familiarity. It likes to do the same thing. It loves routines. Uh, we see that in some cases, people, you know, have to stick to certain routines or they have to do things over and over and over. And again, this can lead to symptoms of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, which again, is one of the features of a left brain anxiety type of problem. Um, the left brain is about approach. It's about going out in the world and seeking things and looking for things. And it's goal directed and motivated. If we, if someone has a problem setting goals or pursuing goals, this is often a left brain deficit um, where they can't get themselves motivated or can't get themselves to do things. If the left brain is overactive, then, you know, this can seem as too much motivation, which can look and wow. feel well of some sort. The left brain has what we call a positive emotions, but that's primarily joy and pride, but also anger. Anger is a left brain emotion. And so obviously too much of that, we see outbursts or tantrums or anger management problems. Um, we can see that the left brain generates again, happiness, 
and pride. If we have a deficit on the left side and we have too much of the right brain, the right brain generates sadness and shame and guilt. Uh, too little, little happiness and too much sad and guilt, and that's major depressive disorder. Um, and we know that, again, that's often associated with anxiety. Um, we see that um, too much positive emotions, again, can be looked at as a mania. Um, the left brain is very academic and intellectual. So we see people are very intelligent um, and have very good memories for things like facts and details, um, especially things like math and science, engineering. The left brain controls the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight system, and it activates the immune system. We can have too much of this, and this can cause inflammation, which can also fuel the brain and fuel um, um, thing, feelings of anxiety and depression as well. The immune system has an impact on the brain and the brain has an impact and really regulates the immune system. Again, too much of the left brain and may see this as things like eczema or uh, food sensitivity or allergies or things such as that. So anxiety, we have the left hemisphere overactivity and this is with a right hemisphere deficit. And these have three factors as well. One is the constantly playing out of simulations and ideas and thoughts and scenarios in, in the head that can't really stop, that are constantly simulating or doing calculations as to what's going to happen and predicting where a situation is going to go. And uh, many people will describe that they can't stop their brain even at night. And most of these scenarios have negative outcomes and often involve social situations because people who are very dominant on the left brain often have trouble reading social cues and don't really pick up on the gist of things or the joke. They often feel like outsiders. So um, this can often lead to anxiety in social situations or social anxiety. Um, we also see that obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, tics, can't stop thoughts or compulsive behaviors um, and things like Tourette's or you know making noises or doing things over and over. And the fear and the anxiety of other people looking at that and judging is what often drives the left brain type of anxiety. The left brain, again, we see strengths are things like intelligence, academics, math, science, reading, facts, motivation, goal-directed, positive happiness, pride, too much pride, though, you know, if we have too much pride in someone, we could see this as a narcissist. Um, but if we have too little pride, we see this as lack of self-esteem, um, fine motor skills, um, strong immune system, and a very good memory, as we said, for facts. Weaknesses is often around the social skills. Um, they don't often get the big picture, so sometimes struggle with reading comprehension and math reasoning. Spatial skills, they may look a little clumsy or awkward in movements or running or sports. Um, they may lack a sense of humor and not really get the joke. They may, in some people consider, they may feel like they lack empathy. They don't really feel or understand other people's emotions as much. Um, they may be more likely to take risks because of feeling less sense of danger because of the right brain deficit. Um, problem solving, you know, looking at that and figuring out things from a unique perspective may be difficult. And an overactive immune system where there's inflammation in the body, eczema, allergies, food sensitivities. Again, the left brain is logical, it's linear, it's sequential, it's goal directed, uh, it's it governs seeking behavior, persistence, which can sometimes be compulsive. Again, memories for facts and predictions. Um, positive emotions and detail oriented. Um, the left brain, again, we see these repetitive thoughts that won't stop, constantly playing out scenarios in the head. Most of the scenarios lead to negative outcomes. And again, obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviors and social anxiety over not fitting in. And this is the left brain type of anxiety. Um, what we see is when we have this imbalance in the brain, scientifically, this is called a functional disconnection syndrome. And this is my primary area of research. This is a development imbalance between the two sides of the brain. It's most commonly the core issue in any mental health issue. 
whether it's depression, anxiety, ADHD, you know, autism, um, uh, OCD, tics, Tourette's, it's always the root cause of those issues. Imbalances are more common in the most gifted people, people that are unusually strong in one side of the brain. Um, are more likely to have a deficit on the opposite side of the brain, especially in childhood. And almost all of these issues now, we know that almost all adult, adult mental health issues start in childhood. There is no damage, there's no injury, there's no genetic mutation, and there's no chemical imbalance. This is a developmental maturational imbalance in the brain, and it can be changed at any point in time. The core issue is neurological, it's not psychological. There can be many triggers or psychological triggers. And we can you know, say, hey, I have a lot of stress in my life, but ultimately feeling anxiety. People may be exposed to the same amount of stress, but some people may really struggle and suffer with anxiety or depression and others may not. And the reason is looking at what's happening in the brain and the balance of the brain. The primary issue is in your brain. That's where you're feeling the anxiety. And it's real, it's 100% real because you're feeling it. And especially when there's overactivity of the right brain. If you're not dealing with the core issue, you're just managing the symptoms. So if you're just trying to talk it out or you're taking medication, um, this may help manage the symptoms, but it's not dealing with the core issue. So how do we balance the brain and how we change things? Well, it, you know, we, we like to individual things, uh, individualized treatments for people. Everybody is different. But ultimately, it starts with looking at movement um, and development. As we said, the, the brain builds from the bottom up. It starts from the brainstem and builds from the bottom up. As, uh, and as the brain is developing, we also have what we call horizontal integration where two sides of the brain need to be able to develop and connect and integrate with one another. If one side of the brain becomes too strong or gains too much of a advantage, then it can hold back the brain. Ultimately, what we see is the developmental process starts with something called primitive reflexes. These are reflexes we're born with that allow us to move and interact with the world and engage our senses and they actually create feedback, which then builds our brain from the bottom up. Uh, once we stand up and walk, these reflexes should go away and allow us to move under our own power and in more complex ways. The more complex we move, the more, the more we build our brain. And ultimately, we build the parts of our brain that control cognition, that are able to learn academically and behaviorally in the world around us. If those reflexes don't go away, then they act as a block to further development of the brain. They may slow down development of one side of the brain. And as we said, the right brain develops in the first three years, and then the left brain develops over the next three years. If, for instance, the reflexes don't go away, the right brain may slow down in its development and the left brain may come on going too strong. And then once the left brain gains advantage, it further inhibits the right brain development. And those two things are holding back and they lead to this imbalance in the brain that only gets worse, doesn't correct. Sometimes the right brain may, may hold on too long and instead of three years, it, it lasts longer and there's a delay in the left brain coming on and that may cause a left brain delay with the right brain being overactive. And once the right brain gains too much of an advantage, it will also inhibit the growth of the left side of the brain. So this is where brain imbalances start. And these imbalances are what can lead to ultimately, you know, all different types of mental health or behavioral issues. Um, the way that we can change this is first through movement, doing different exercises. We can do different core exercises. There are different activities to stimulate these reflexes if they are actually retained. It, there's, there's ways of testing if the primitive reflexes are retained and we can get rid of them, which then removes the blockage. That's the first thing we need to do. We need to remove the blockage and build up our muscle tone and, and also make sure that we have balance in our posture. If we develop an imbalance in our brain, it causes an imbalance in our body, can lead to things like head tilts, body tilts, 
And this can cause problems in the neck and the back that can lead to neck pain, back pain, headaches. So different types of adjustments of the spine can help. There are different exercises able to um, reproduce different developmental movements that can also further inhibit these reflexes. We can do balance exercises. We can do exercises with eye movement in different directions, the right, the left, up and down. We can spin someone in one direction or another to activate their inner ear on one side more than the other. All right. So we also know that we can use different types of visual stimulation. We can shine light in one eye or in the corner of one eye to go to one side of the brain. We can cause that light to flash at a certain frequency that can literally change the frequency of firing in different brain networks. We can use different colored lenses and those can flash light and that can also be used to change brainwave frequencies. We can put different electrodes on the head that can actually um, uh, inhibit one side or activate the other. We can use music or sound. We can use uh, vibration and sound. We can do it in one ear at different frequencies. We can use music. Um, with different types of tones or different frequencies, um, high frequency for the left brain, low frequency for the right brain. We can block different types of visual fields so that light and vision can only come into one side and go to one side of the brain. Smell is very important for our emotions and using different smells. And there are right brain and left brain types of smells. Um, that can like pleasant smells for the left brain or very strong, powerful or unpleasant smells for the right brain. We can do different types of metronome type of training. We use something called the interactive metronome, which is a great tool that helps to create balance and coordination between both sides of the body, which can also be used to create balance and coordination in both sides of the brain. We have different video games and virtual reality programs we can use that can be directed towards one side of the brain or the other. We can do something called neurofeedback, which can be very helpful. We can use lasers and, and what's called photobiomodulation and different frequencies. And we can use that again to change different brainwave connections. Um, we can do different cognitive skills working from memory or attention and different academic types of training as well to uh, focus on different areas of the brain and different skills. In our office, we do something called QEEG, where we can do brain imaging, where we can actually measure these brainwave activities, and we can see these overactive networks and underactive networks, and we've been able to show that we can change that before and after using a variety of different treatment. Um, Harvard Medical School, McLean Hospital, the number one mental institution in the uh, United States, did an independent study of my work and basically confirmed that they saw changes in the brain that they had never seen before and that they said were consistent with my theory on brain balance by removing bottom-up interference, by integrating reflexes and then specifically stimulating the underdeveloped right hemisphere, we could help stimulate growth and maturation in, the, in one side of the brain to restore synchrony in networks. This would promote integration and may dampen activity that may have been overactive in the left hemisphere, creating a balance between these areas. Ultimately, it's about creating integration. It's about making the brain and the networks of the brain work together in an integrated way. When there is an imbalance, when there is overactivity, when there's overdevelopment and underdevelopment, this creates a variety of symptoms that's individualized. We can measure this um, we can do virtual programs with people. We can do this in person. And if you're interested in more info about what we can do, uh, we can book them. You can book a virtual consultation. Go to my website, drrobertmalillo.com. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Dr. Robert Malillo. Okay. All right. So let's see if um, we'll go to the chat and let's see if there are any questions here that I might be able to answer. So one question here, could a child have both left and right brain deficits? Yes, if there is a, uh, a, if there are retained primitive reflexes, then quite often there are delays on both sides, but there is almost always gonna be a deficit more on one side than the other. And that's very important to understand because um, this is where, you know, we can see that, you know, this is where we can help people. Um, 
let me put on my video here so I can speak to you guys personally. Um, so yes, they can be on both sides, but in almost every case, there will be an imbalance. And um, the first session, obviously, the first thing we need to do is look and address those primitive reflexes if they're there. Um, then should we always prioritize the right side deficit in autism? If autism is the proper diagnosis, then yes, autism is always a right hemisphere deficit with genius level left hemisphere skills. And even if they don't seem like it, um, virtually every kid that we've ever worked with has these genius level left brain skills. Um, there was another question there. Um, are there side effects during treatment for right brain anxiety? Uh, no, uh, what we're doing is pretty, is very naturalistic. Uh, we're not really changing, uh, we're changing the brain, but we're not doing anything that is, uh, you know, invasive per se. Um, and so therefore, we don't really generally see side effects per se. But as behavioral changes, as the brain changes, we often see behavior changes. So that can be that, you know, we, we often say that change is good, but it doesn't always look good initially. Um, I wrote my second book, Reconnected Kids, all about this. Um, okay. How do you differentiate between an overactivity on one side versus underactivity? Well, that's a good question, Rayanne. Um, essentially, if you have a deficit on one side, you will get an overactivity on the other. The brain works that way in balance. There's been some really good studies on this, and we've done studies on this as well. Um, and the symptoms that we see is a combination of both. For instance, in ADHD, the attention deficit is from the right side, which is the right brain. It pays attention, especially what we call sustained attention. But the hyperactivity is due to overactivity of a specific area called Broadman Area 6 on the left. So both of them come together to produce symptoms. Is it possible that PET scans say right frontal temporal lobe hypometabolism, but when we test as per your disconnected kid book, it shows a left brain deficit. Yes, you know, PET scans can be tricky. Um, even the imaging that we do with, uh, with um, QEEG, it can be tricky because one of the problems we see is that when we have overactivity on one side, um, we will see inhibition of the other side. So we can have overactivity of an inhibitory network with an inhibitory neurotransmitter like GABA, but yet we can also have overactivity of an excitatory network with glutamate on the other side. Um, it makes it very difficult to differentiate because all we can see through imaging is activity or overactivity or underactivity. So, you know, just looking at what's happening um, in an area where an area may look like it's less active. That's why looking at functional measurements, doing a proper neurological exam, and always, you know, looking at the symptoms. The symptoms are and the history are very, very important. That gives us a really much more accurate description. Um, I came to listen about my twins with autism, but I found you mentioned a lot that my 16-year-old neurotypical child struggled with. Do you feel brain balance can help someone with anxiety and OCD? that came on strong post pandemic. Yes, I mean, this is why I wanted to do this webinar because you know, since the pandemic, as I showed the statistic early on, there's been a massive increase in anxiety, especially amongst young people. But again, anybody feeling anxiety or depression, um, there is an imbalance in the brain. I mean, that's where those symptoms are coming from. And what we see is that, you know, there are traits. And if you look at um, autism in a family um, tend to be highly intelligent, tend to be more left brain dominant. And so therefore other children in the family may also be very left brain dominant and very intelligent. I'm sure your 16 year old is brilliant, um, but they are, may also be prone to an imbalance with a deficit on the right side. Um, is neurofeedback good treatment for a kid with ADHD? I, we use neurofeedback and it's a great tool. But if you have bottom-up issues like primitive reflexes or problems with core stability, then 
you need to deal with those first. Um, I look at neurofeedback as a top-down approach that is something that is later on in treatment, more kind of like the icing on the cake that we do. So we don't, um, you know, we don't really look at that as a first line treatment. And I don't think it's a good first line treatment for kids with ADHD. I think um, you need to look at other things first, but as a second line or third line treatment, I think it is excellent. Um, and we do, do, do that here. Um, Okay, uh, are you training others to further impact your work? Yes, I have a course, it's online. I have a fellowship course and a certification course that I've been teaching for about 25 years. And uh, we're just completing next weekend, the last um, live course in Dallas will be there. We will be starting it up in New York um, at the famous TWA hotel at JFK airport. And um, this is going to be really a great course, the culmination of all my work. And um, that will start June 3rd, the weekend of June 3rd, and it will go on for 10 modules. So again, if you want more information on that, um, it is on my website, but also there are people certified in my method around the world. If you go to our website, you can find out where they are. Um, and um, if you're going to you know, go to somebody about this, then I suggest you go only to people that have been trained and certified in my work. Would uh, working PMRF um, with inhibition of PR make sense or use of contralateral context, complex movements? Um, so I assume what you're talking about again is the pontine medullary reticular formation and the um, primitive reflexes. So. The brainstem where we're talking about there is where the primitive reflexes come from. And so what we see is that, you know, we want to activate the lower brainstem, the medulla and the pons, which is really where the pontomedullary reticular formation is found. And so activating that is actually very important um, because that is ultimately the maturation of that area is what inhibits the primitive reflexes. So it's very important that we um, are doing that, that we're activating that brain, those brainstem areas. And we can do that through different types of stimulation that I discussed here. Obviously we can get into that in more complex. Uh, being in India, how can you do your program? We do have virtual programs. Um, I have an, a virtual adult program. Um, and we also have virtual programs that we do with children all over the world. Um, if you go to my website, you'll be able to find out more about that. Um, we are constantly training people and we're looking to hopefully train people in India soon. Um, amazing session. Thank you for all you do. I've seen a remarkable gains in my two-year-old son with your program. Thank you very much. Uh, will we have access to the recording of today's talk? That's a good question. And we are recording it, so we can make that available. Uh, we'll figure that out, but um, we'll let you know, okay? Uh, do we have to rule out chemical imbalance or other toxicities like mold? You know, as far as chemical imbalances, that really doesn't exist, but things like toxicity and mold is very important. You don't have to rule that out. Um, we look at that. Uh, you know, my current course that we're teaching in New York, we've kind of um, had an evolution, and the title of the course is called uh, Developmental Functional um, Behavioral Neuroimmunology, because neuroimmunology is becoming more and more a, a large, important part of what we do. So that's part of the program, was looking at things like toxicity and mold and, you know, all these other issues is part of what we do as part of our program. Um, my son always taps on his face and hands with hands, always stims something. Uh, is this a right brain deficit? Typically stims, and again, it's, you know, we have to look at the individual person, but typically stims are overactivity of an area called Brodmann area six on the left, and it's related to an area called the basal ganglia. Um, this is usually related to a right brain deficit. So there's a deficit of the right brain and what we call the hyperdirect pathway. 
So usually stick ticks and stims and physical ticks are usually more commonly related to a right brain deficit. Is there any podcast any sites where we can hear more from you? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I've done podcasts in the, if you go to my website, I have a lot of, I've done, you know, a number of different TV shows and radio shows. And if you go to YouTube, there's a lot of different lectures of mine. Um, if you just Google me on YouTube, you'll find a lot of, you know, my past work. Um, let's see, for a year old with all positive primitive reflexes who still has never sat up on his own or crawled, would we do the exercises or extinguish the reflexes anyway. Um, the way that you do it with a young child that really can't move, like a child with um, you know, severe autism or things like that, is that you need to stimulate the reflexes. You can't rely on exercises. You don't do primitive reflex exercises with children, obviously, that can't sit up or crawl. You will stimulate them. And this is part of what I do when I train people um, and when we do virtual programs, you know, we send videos to people to show them how to do it. And we essentially stimulate them the way you test for the reflex. Uh, when is there going to be a French version of the book, Clem? Yes, um, definitely looking for that. Um, we're dying for that. But um, uh, unfortunately, there isn't one yet. But hopefully someone, uh, a French publisher will be interested. I was so surprised when I was in Paris as to how many bookstores there were in France, probably more bookstores than I've seen in any other country. So if there's any country I'd love to see my book translated into, it would be French. Um, if an infant doesn't have a rooting reflex and has latching issues, should we um, have parents stimulate rooting? Um, yes, and this is usually an issue with, with low tone in general, uh, almost always related to an imbalance that's developing in the brain. And, um, you know, yes, we want to stimulate to try to bring on, but it's not just doing the rooting reflex. We have to look at other reflexes that may um, not be emerging or may be, uh, you know, also uh, retained, depending on how old. If it's an infant, then typically those reflexes are supposed to be there. So we want to stimulate them to come out. Um, there are ways of trying to get the child to move and interact um, in my new course that we're teaching in, in, uh, in June, we have in the first module, we have really cool techniques on working with infants in the first three months and how to help improve motor tone and movement. Um, my three-year-old son uh, pushes friends at school. What can I do? Um, you know, again, this is kind of a broad question, uh, but if there is a problem with social development, um, he may not be picking up on social cues. It may be a right brain delay where he's not really picking up. He might be, you know, a space invader. Um, he might have like a form of ADHD where their approach behavior of the left brain and not really picking up on social cues. So that I'm sure he's not trying to hurt other kids, um, but he's just over enthusiastic. Um, but that can get, you know, much more severe. And in today's day and age, schools really frown on that, right? They don't really have any tolerance for it. So it can really be a problem. He can be labeled as a, you know, a troublemaker kid, and that can be a problem. So again, that can often be related to a right brain delay. But, you know, you should um, uh, read my book, Disconnected Kids, and get a better sense of that. Um, if you have any questions, really, the first thing you should do is get my book, Disconnected Kids, to really get a, a sense of what's happening and where your child fits from a right brain or a left brain standpoint. Um, another one, in, in the, is the anxiety due to gravitational insecurity? Um, you know, that's a good question, Ramona. And, you know, Jane Ayers, who really started sensory integration technique, she talked a lot about gravitational insecurity which is really a proprioceptive deficit. So the right brain really is primarily involved with spatial and visual spatial and proprioceptive relationships, as well as what we call interoception, you know, feeling those internal senses and feelings. So um, what we see is that, you know, if there's a problem with proprioception, children may, you know, feel unsafe, uh, but, 
this can lead to what looks like anxiety and it may actually be a you know a, a type of anxiety but you know the anxiety um can be related to that but what we're looking is you know when there's a deficit in proprioception there's usually overactivity of other networks on the other side and that is what's generating the anxiety right so the anxiety is always being generated by specific networks in the brain we have to remember that right so but um you know that's uh, a good question during child development is there a specific class of to of tooth to see my child at 18 months and i can see a class of two three um i'm sorry i'm not really sure what that means a class of tooth um so you know i i'm not i'm not familiar with that um okay a couple more questions with my twins one seems more left brain deficit and the other right uh but they are identical and started off with almost the same delays like nonverbal, low tone aggression etc has since progressed much more than the other have you seen this often seems to happen a lot with twins yeah i have seen it i have seen it very often with twins <clears throat> where one may be a right brain deficit and the other may be a left brain deficit. And, you know, some of that has to do with, you know, the way they're laying in the womb. Um, we know that, you know, um, you know, their position in the womb um, and their exposure to, to different sensory information can have more of an impact on one side of the brain or the other. Um, we see this in other animals. Um, we know that, you know, if they lie, like, Chicks lie a certain way. They have light come in. That it's light does come in. Throat where in America, the throat where. I'm sorry, um, is it, are we talking right now? Reflexes. Um, so I just log of face. Is that Muriel? Muriel. Mar 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 woman, to draw the oak law is. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, please. Okay, please. Uh, more of live talks like today. Okay, I will. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, we'll probably do this one again um, on anxiety uh, because we had a little little bit of a glitch today with a, with a, a Facebook Live, um, but we will do this again. Which type of primitive reflex exercise usually helps with speech? You know, I don't look at primitive reflexes necessarily as, you know, for a specific symptom, even though there are some lists that correlate. But when somebody talks about speech, you know, of course, we have the rooting reflex and we have the babkin reflex and we have the snout reflex, the mouth reflexes, but speech delays are usually pretty complicated. Uh, right brain speech delays, which right brain deficits, as we see in autism, are really because of two things. One, because of a nonverbal communication delay, um, which, you know, reduces the drive to want to attach and communicate and share experiences and not understanding nonverbal cues, facial expression, gestures, all of that. But then also the right brain becomes embodied and we connect to our body. And if we don't feel our body, then we don't take ownership of our body. And we can't really plan movements with our body if we don't feel our body. So I believe that many times with children, especially with autism that don't speak, um, that really can't get words out. A lot of it is that they can't plan the motor activity in their mouth because their mouth literally is almost numb to them. And their whole body may be somewhat numb to them. They don't feel it. We know that they may have a really high pain threshold. Um, now, on the other hand, if you have a left brain delay, you may have a deficit you know, primarily of the language uh, areas of the brain and motor planning in the left brain. And therefore, you know, that is a problem with coordinating the muscles um, because of a primary motor planning problem where uh, it's not a sensory issue. But in autism, I believe it starts with a primary sensory motor deficit, in particular on the right side. Um, how long is the virtual anxiety treatment program? Um, it's really as long as needed. Um, you know, it really depends on the individual person and what their response, what, what their needs are. So we take that as an individual person. Um, what do you think of postural insoles? Um, I think they can be very helpful. I think, um, 
you know, they uh, when they're done right, I think if they're done wrong, they can be devastating. But obviously, posture and uh, the spine itself is the core of everything. And postural development is what initially develops the brain itself. Being bipedal, obviously, is what, what makes the human brain unique. So if we're not standing on a stable, um, you know, base, then that can have a big impact on our brain itself. So I think that, you know, looking at insoles um, and going to somebody that's very competent with that. Um, I don't generally do insoles, uh, but I will sometimes, you know, send people out to get them done. Okay. All right. I think that's it for today. Thank you for joining me. We will do this again. Um, and I appreciate all your feedback. Uh, please, you know, let me know what you liked, what you didn't like, so we can change it and we can make it better for you. And hopefully next time we'll do the technology piece a little bit more efficiently. Okay. If you want a copy of the recording, um, I believe that uh, we can make that available for you. But again, um, go to my website, drrobertmalillo.com. Please follow me on Instagram. We're always putting really neat stuff up on Instagram and on Facebook, okay? All right, guys, uh, we'll see you again soon. Have a great weekend. Thank you.